Welcome everyone to the Creating New Ways to Visualize Streamflow Properties Using Graffer webinar. Hi everyone, my name is Drew and I'll be the co-host of today's presentation. We have a great webinar uh, for everyone today where we're going to delve into using Graffer uh, by showing you a few projects that Dr. Rick Kaler, one of our power users and our guest host, created using Graffer that show his approach to quantifying and displaying stream uh, flow properties. I always like to start out our webinars by giving you a little bit of background about myself and our guest host. Uh, I've been working in uh, Gold Software for 14 years. We're a member of our tech support team and an account manager. And I'd also like to introduce you to our co-host, Dr. Rick Kaler, who is the founder, owner, and CEO of Visual Data Analytics and is the innovator of the data visualization techniques on the projects we will be discussing today. Um, here's a little bit more on Rick's background. His experience in water resources goes back 30 years, including being the director of water resources for an environmental consultant company. He served as Co Cochise County hydrologist in Arizona and also as a forecast hydrologist with the National Weather Service. Rick attended the University of Arizona where he earned his BS in watershed and natural resource management. And he also earned his uh, master's in hydrographic sciences at the US Naval Postgrad uh, School in Monterey, California. Rick got his PhD in watershed management uh, with a minor in remote sensing and image analysis uh, from the University of Arizona. All right, Rick, can you uh, say hi to everyone? Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this talk. Yeah, thank you, Rick. So after the discussion of each topic, I'm going to stop for just a minute or two to answer any questions. You can send your questions over to uh, me using the Q&A uh, button or feature located on the Zoom toolbar at any time during the presentation. This is where you can type in your question and it'll be sent to the uh, over to me who uh, I'll either answer it or, or Rick can answer it. So please feel free to send your uh, questions at any time again during the presentation using that Q&A function rather than the uh, chat feature. This will allow uh, and ensure uh, that we see the questions in a timely manner. All right, we're also going to be recording today. So later this week, we're going to post a recording um, uh, on our website and uh, we'll send you an email when that re uh, recording is posted. All right, so we have a lot to get covered today. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this on over to Rick and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Great, thank you, Drew. And thanks again for everyone for showing up. So this will be a different way of looking at Streamflow properties using Grapher as a way to uh, visualize the information. Um, before we get started, here's kind of the background of what we're gonna be doing. We'll go over some common terms and the challenge that we face the data preparation and configuration approach itself that I'm using. I'll have a case study for the Colorado River in the Western United States, followed by a graffer demo along with a summary. Over here, I have an image of some people working in the river from the US National Park Service, and they're recording, determining metrics related to timing and quantity of stream flow. Well, that's what I'm gonna be talking about is the timing and quantity of stream flow. By the way, if you look up in the upper right hand corner, I have a red circle around the slide number. If you have a question about a specific slide, try and note which slide number it is. That'll make it much easier for me to go right back to the uh, slide that you had a question about. Well, let's go ahead and dive in here. When I talk about stream flow properties, a lot of it is ecology based. The five main topics that you see for this, the main uh, parts of this are magnitude, which is how much, Frequency is how often, duration is how long, timing is when, and change in flow is the persistence or the randomness of the flow. Again, another nice little image here from our folks at the Park Service about water flowing through the stream. And so that's what we were trying to quantify is this water that is flowing. Here's the challenge. We want to quantify these stream flow properties. The prevailing technique as it is right now, uses uh, descriptive statistics. This is uh, usually a subset from over 170 existing index values. 
Most of these are composition based. And what I mean by that is there's no temporal order in, in the information. It'd be like finding the mean of a set of values. You can reorder those values, the mean will remain the same. There's no uh, order on there. Uh, line, box, box, whistle, graphs, tables are quite often used. And one size fits all is the approach. So in this statistical approach, you could think of it as a single spreadsheet formula. These formulas determine statistical parameters. Those parameters then are then in turn used to come up with a theoretical distribution. But this process, often the configuration or the order information is lost. Well, what do I bring to the table? What's different? This has been used by quite a few people. I'm using a temporal based approach, these metrics, which is a new option for you. The emphasis is on data configuration. You'll see that there's much more detailed information. I believe improved visual, uh, visual information on the graphics and it's highly customizable. So with the sequential, you can think of this as many spreadsheet formulas. We'll determine the metrics which directly show the empirical distribution of the data configuration is preserved. So whereas statistical, you might have a single value, I have to compute the difference between uh, one and two, two and three, three and four, four and five. So there's a lot more uh, spreadsheets, uh, formulas that are used in the types of uh, metrics that I'm developing. Uh, here's, here's what you have for your statistical. Um, you have all these annual means, mins and max for these different areas. Well, with the sequential approach, rather than being limited to just the monthly mean, uh, we can do the distribution for any time period of interest. Rather than the mean of the annual mins or maxes, I look at the summation for all flow levels for any time period. The flow uh, duration distribution is broken out by flow category. For the timing, the Julian day for the mean or for the annual min or max, I look at the dates for all flows for all flow conditions. Whereas we have these pulses, I can break out the increase or decrease pulse of any interest for any period. And finally, down here at the bottom, uh, the current techniques that you hear about the mean for all positive differences for consecutive daily means or negative means, number of rises, number of falls. I break out flow class and distribution for specific flow levels, decreases or no change. Uh, bottom line is I look at all changes for all flows. It doesn't matter if it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, daily data. I will look at all changes for all flows. Well, if we look at kind of what's out there, the prevailing system, I found this nice little flow chart. Audiences just really don't like flow charts, so bear with me for just a bit here. But you go through this process and you find out these different uh, flow uh, conditions for extreme low flow, low, uh, low flow, small flood, large flood, and higher pulse. Well, after you go through the process of this flow chart, how do you interpret? How do you look at the results? Well, a lot of times it's a tabular scorecard. And I don't mean to have you read the tiny fonts here. I'm just trying to impress upon you. There are a lot of squares in this, on these tables. And how do you relate one particular cell to another particular cell? This is this was what causes audiences' got, uh, eyes to glaze over. Or they may try this range of variability approach where you look at all those different hydrologic indicators and uh, they'll try and show things this way or a time series plot before and after some sort of an impact. Well, what am I going to do here? I'm gonna show you and demo the sequential approach. I'll be looking at the upper Colorado basin which is here in the Western United States. It's about um, 111,000 square miles. Uh, 44 different US states could fit into this particular area. It, any one of those states could fit in there. What's interesting is uh, we have a record before and after Glen Canyon Dam was put in place. This is the Lake Powell Reservoir that's behind here. 
And here we have the dam at about 16 miles downstream, about 25 kilometers downstream is where the gauge is. So we have the gauge uh, record before and after the dam was in place. So here is a rest of hydrographs. This is a different way of looking at the hydrologic record. On the x-axis, I have the day of the year. And the y-axis, I have the water year. In the US, a water year begins on October 1st. That's why you see the offset there. And Glen Canyon Dam came online in the early 1960s. So that record before is without the dam. And we see this blue area here of higher flows in May and June. This is the snow melt coming off of the Rocky Mountains, passing by the gauge. We also see a year where there is no blue, so we can see drought conditions here. We can see a particular individual storm. Not only do we see the storm, we see how long the effects of the storm had lasted through the system. So we have those types of things here. I will use my techniques to quantify this area before the dam. What I'm going to do then is compare the post-dam uh, metrics and we'll look at those differences. Some of the patterns that we see caused by the regulation of the dam is that you get abrupt flow changes like between one month and another. The color here uh, changes quite markedly. We see a blue area here in the mid 1980s. This was an El Nino event in the Western United States. There was so much snow that the dam and the reservoir, it completely filled up. In fact, they had put um, plywood on top of the dam to get another couple of feet of draft on the, over the reservoir. Other interesting patterns that you see here are these diagonal lines, which appear everywhere. Well, those are Sundays. They produce electricity at this dam. There's lower electrical demand on the weekends because offices are closed in Los Angeles and other areas. Less electrical demand, less water passes through the turbines to produce the electricity. Therefore, less water shows up in the river itself. We can see some artificial flows that uh, the operators of the dam, the Bureau of Reclamation will do at times. We can compare those with actual floods. The other interesting thing is, you'll see a very faint line here on December 25th. So there's a Christmas record that we can see in doing this. So we want to compare what we have after the dam is in place with regulation versus what the river was before. So to do this, we're going to tap into something called an autocorrelation lag one plot. It's a very simple process for plotting up the data. Basically, we have a date. In American, we've got the month, year, and day, and we have the flow in cubic feet per second. We take this data series and we shift it up and over. So our X value, our Q sub T, is the day of the flow of that particular day. Then our Q sub T plus one, which is gonna be our Y coordinate, is the, um, the next day over here. Very straightforward, the X and Y is the Q sub T, and Q sub T plus one. And please note on this graph, this is a, a log log plot where I have logarithmic X and logarithmic Y axes. Well, I look at that and you see this, you can come up with an autocorrelation function of 0.994, which shows high degree of persistence, high level autocorrelation. But there's a lot more information than that. What appears to be scatter is actually stream flow properties here. So I'm gonna overlay onto this a y equals x line. This is not a regression. I'm just putting in this particular function. Why? Because any point on that line tells me there is no flow change from one day to the next. So that means that any point above that line is part of rising stream flow conditions. Any point below that line are falling stream flow conditions. And in fact, we can come up with a change ratio here, the y over the x, or the Q sub T plus one divided by the Q sub T. And if that fraction is equal to one, there's no change. If it's greater than one, it's a rising limb. If it's less than one, it's a falling limb. A couple more equations here, whoops. And then we can put these brackets of these uh, flow change uh, lines on here. So any point on that would be a two times increase from the day before or a reduction in flow by one half. Because this is a log-log plot, 
these lines are parallel to the center. Now, if this was a linear scale, the uh, 2x and 1 half x would flare out away from the y equals x line. But because it's logarithmic, these lines are parallel to each other. Um, if I look at the difference between the y coordinate and the x coordinate, that's simply the change in flow from q sub t time minus q sub t. That's our change in flow per day. Uh, you can think of the x axis as like today. And you can think of the y axis as tomorrow. Uh, current day, following day, something like that. If we look at that change ratio minus one times the Q sub T, it's exactly the same as the difference between the flows, which is the change in flow per day. So there's a lot of information here. In fact, look at this. We have all the increases or no changes or decreases. We have a way of identifying flow pulses, increases in the flow. We also have a measure of flashiness, the autocorrelation function here. Uh, the one simply stands for a one day shift on that. Uh, we see the magnitude of the flows. We see the range of the flows. We can see the frequency. And because they are uh, one day to the next, we can see the duration of each of those points represents one day. Uh, but what about timing? I mean, thing is, is time can be a coordinate but it can also be an attribute. I have every one of these points here are time stamped. So if I know the date, I know the month. If I know the month, I know the uh, season. So I can plot this out and break them up by season. So I see what's going on here in the winter, spring, summer, and autumn or fall. We see during the winter time, we have clustering towards the lower end, but not the lowest flows. In the springtime, because of the snow melt, we'll have higher flows, but there are no low flows. Summertime, we have the highest and the lowest flows. And in the autumn, it's kind of clustered towards the center. There's a few points above that, but mainly, mainly in the center to the lower end. But we can do some data exploration at this point. If I were to look at winter time, and I'm looking at that 2x line. I'm looking for how many data points are above that 2x line, and I see one point. Out of 38 years of record, there's one point. I come here to spring, and I'm looking, and I can see, well, I can see three points above that. Summertime, I've got, well, one on there, and a couple others, maybe about four points. But I look at autumn. Autumn, there's a dozen points above that line. There's something different about autumn. This is the exploration part. Let's take a deeper dive and look at the autumn. If we do that, here we got the autumn, and now I'm using two different products from Golden Software. I have my grapher on the right, and I also have surfer on the left, where I have that raster hydrograph. And I'm looking at September, October, November, and each of these points has an associated location in one of those three months. Let's pick a point, let's pick this one right here. September 12th, 1927. Well, this is easy to find because I come here in September, I know it's within the September column. I see the 1927 and there is the event which caused that point to be right there. Okay, well, that's, that's good to see that, but what's so special about September 12th, 1927? Well, I did a study a few years ago looking at winter base flows in the southwestern area of uh, the United States here in southern Arizona, and I needed to know the precipitation sources. So we get summer monsoons, we get winter frontal systems, but we also get late summer, early autumn tropical depressions that could come through. Not often, and this is nothing like Florida, but we do get these through here. Well, a little extra research on Google produced this little note from the National Weather Service for 1927, September 12th, 1927. Hurricane off of the Gulf of California, which is between Baja, California, and Mexico, came ashore in Western Mexico. One to two inches of rain reported over much of Arizona. Ah, here's a more contemporary example. 2004, Javier was a tropical storm that came in. The surface low tracked to the south in the southeast part of Arizona. But that moisture, the upper disturbance, 
clearly went way into Colorado, even up to Minnesota, perhaps parts of Canada here. So we can easily see that these tropical depressions can deliver moisture into the upper Colorado basin. So that one point, because we had it time stamped and it stood out, we found out that the source of precipitation was tropical storm remnant. And as I look closer at this autumn storm flow, I'm looking at several of these points. And as I'm looking at the timestamp, they're all associated with the exact same event, which is what I have down here. I'm calling this my lag one hydrograph. So at September 11th, down here, the flow between the 11th and the 12th, the ratio of those two, well, there's no change. It's on the one line. It's exactly what we have here. As I go from September 12th to the 13th, we're going from a little over 40,000 to over 80,000 cubic feet per second. That's a doubling in the flow. Well, here we are on that 2x line. And as we continue, we're, we're increasing, but we're increasing at a decreasing rate. And we can see that the points are still above the black line because they're still increasing. Once we get to the 15th to the 16th, we have falling flow conditions, and then we have a recession along here. This is kind of interesting. The X value has the date and it has a flow. That's our Q. If we have a point, that point is the change in flow per day. Well, that's our first differential here, dQ, dt, first derivative. If we look at adjacent points, we have the change in the change in flow, which is our second order derivative. It's sort of like uh, uh, distance, velocity, and acceleration all on the same chart. As far as the uh, first order derivative, if it's above the line, that dQ dt is greater than one or greater than zero. If it's on the line, it is dQ dt is equal to zero and below the line, dQ dt is less than zero. What's interesting is this paper by Yang from 2020 talking about extracting base flow recessions on second order derivatives. Well, that's exactly what we have here. These are your second order derivatives that we have here. So you can come up with a power function with using these data points here. Okay, great. We've got this. You can see it. It makes some good visuals. How do we quantify that? Well, we're going to have to create some histogram categories. We're going to need to bin this data. We're going to summarize the results. Here on the x-axis of this plot, I have the observed flows. And here is my categorized flows on the y-axis. I'm using a log 10 interval of 0.5. When I plot up the data here and run a regression, the coefficient of determination, the r squared, is 0.84, just below 0.85 rounded. Well, that's great. But it describes about 84% of the data variability. If I change my interval to 0.1, I'm going to have more classes but I am describing the data variability much better. I can describe 99% of the data variability in that case. So what I did was is I put together a little table here, and this seems to make sense. I need more, I want to get that coefficient of determination higher to describe more of the data variability. I'm gonna to have to have smaller and smaller intervals. Smaller intervals means more number of categories here. And to go from 0.95 to 0.99, I went from 10 to 22, you know, a few more classes, but to squeeze out that last little bit to go from 9925 to 995, I'm gonna have to have four times as many categories here. So there's a, there's a trade-off there. What I have found for my work, it may be different for you, but uh, that 99.99, if I can describe about 99% of the variability, that works out great. It's always around 22 or so categories. What does this mean? I will take this and I will calculate the categories I'm going to use for reclassifying the observed flow. You can see it's based on the log 10 value. And that's how come I have this seemingly odd uh, interval here, but it's actually based on the logarithm. What I went ahead is I rounded this to the nearest whole cubic feet per second value here. So now, Let's go back and see what we're going to do with that. So here's my Colorado River before the dam, 
early part of the record. I have my observed flows are the gray circles and my categorized flow value are the green circles. And at this point, if I had an actual audience, I would ask people, are there more gray circles or are there more green circles? And people would say, wow, it looks pretty obvious. There's more gray circles. In fact, there are the exact same number of circles. What we're doing is we're reclassifying the information here. And so 18 of those gray circles were re reclassified to the same green circle here. We're reclassifying the data. The reason you don't see all of them, all of them is that they're stacked on top of each other like poker chips on a table at a casino. Those poker chips are stacked on top of each other. All we're seeing is the top chip, but they have several underneath them. So yes, there are the same number, but we just don't see them. We're only seeing the top chip in some cases here. Well, we assign numbers here. Well, I can go ahead and assign numbers to all those points, and this is what I get. I get a change in flow summary matrix. What I have here is the flows at different categories, but now rather than a single value to describe all the increases, I can tell you the number of times and the level of increase that has taken place for any flow of interest. I've done this for the entire record. So what I have here is I have all flows, all changes and all pulses in here. I can see the number and the magnitude of the changes. It's easy to tell the frequency because I have the numbers broken out. The duration, since these are each daily change, I can look at say 10,000 followed by 10,000 cubic feet per second with 773 days over the period of the record. So I can know the distribution both within and between flow levels. A lot of information we wouldn't have gotten through the normal statistical calculations of the values here. But there's something I need to break out. I'm not quite done here. Where this is easy to say there were 110 times where 10,000 increased to the next higher level here. What about that 773? Is it one big continuous sequence? Is it a bunch of smaller ones? Is it a mix? That was the next step I need to take. So I used Grapher to compare, uh, create this graph. I also use it to create this, a flow duration chart. Truly flow duration, not a flow duration curve, which has no order information in it. Here we do. It's the same number of flow days per category and there's no double counting. Taking the 10,000 as a breakout, this tells me I have one sequence that's 28 days long. I have one sequence that's 20 days long. Here I have two sequences that are 10 days long. I have 71 sequences that are two days long. I have 91 instances, whoops, where the value before and the value after the number is different. And then I've broken it out for all the different flow categories here. So I've taken that one number on that central 1x line, and I have broken all of those out into this plot here. Before I get going any further, that's the, that's the gist of it. I've shown you the steps needed, the rationale behind those graphs that I have created. And so we have a way of quantifying what the flow of the river was before Glen Canyon Dam was put into place. Drew, maybe this would be a good place just to stop to see if I have any quick questions at this time. I see that someone has their hand up. Okay, everyone, if anybody has any questions for Rick, uh, let's go ahead and send those on over using the Q&A function so we can uh, get those answered here in a timely manner. Well, it's a lot of new information. So maybe people are still processing at this time. Uh, Janine, if you could send a question in, I see you do have your hand up. And now you don't. <laughs> All right, Rick. Well, let's go ahead and uh, just continue get, on. Uh, okay. Get back after it. Sure. Here and. Uh, we can address some questions here at the end of the presentation. Perfect. That sounds like a All nice right. way to go. So right, here we have these. Yes, thank you, Drew. 
we have what the river was before the dam was in place. And now we're going to look at what the river characteristics are based on releases from the dam, which is uh, just upstream of the gauge. And here we go. Here's our pre-dam change in flow plot. The R value is 0.994. And here's the post-dam. The R value is 0.949. Hey, those numbers are very similar. Oh my, I guess I would expect to see the distribution of the points to be very, very similar. And that is not the case. At a glance, you can see that this is very, very different conditions. What we see is things are pretty consistent in the natural system, but under regulated efforts here, we see that we have a very distorted kind of distribution there. We look at the lower flows and we see there's, uh, there's a chaotic nature to this. We look at the mid flows and there certainly are a lot more increases and decreases, yet at the highest flows, you have extreme persistence going on here. So when you use a single value to describe a data set, you're always in danger of misrepresenting the whole data set based on a few values. What's going on here in this case, that our value is biased by these very large values, 100,000 versus several of those lower ones at 1,000. So this is making this appear much larger. If I were to look at just the R value for the lower part here, this would be like uh, 0.3 to 0.4 for the R value here. Highly, highly dispersed, much more randomized, absolutely a chaotic situation. The other thing here that jumps out is in those lower flows. Typically on a river, at the lower flows, when you don't have rain, you don't have snow melt, the river is still running, you have your base flow driven flows. Typically, you would expect the base flow being from the aquifer to provide a very consistent low flow signal uh, for the hydrologic system, the hydrologic regime. Uh, maybe that base flow is important for an organism for migration purposes, or maybe for some sort of reproduction activity. We see that the way the dam is releasing water, it's completely destroyed any kind of base flow signature. There is no uh, signal to an organism for any kind of life process. They've, just, they've completely distorted that. The reason is it's that power production and that uh, Sunday's uh, pattern that we saw earlier. If we break it out by season, winter and spring, we see indeed that that pattern is existing irrespective of what the season is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, I was telling you that before there was only one data point above the 2x line before the line. Now there's dozens of them. So we have highly variable, highly changing flow conditions on here, going from very high to very low uh, from one day to the next. Again, the spring never had low flows. Now you're getting low flows all the time. Um, same for summer, we see some of that pattern there, and then the autumn as well. The other thing we can do is we can look at this flow matrix. Let's go ahead and zoom in and look at, uh, say, 4,000 and 10,000. So in this case, how many times did the flow of 4,000 be followed by a flow of 4,000 for our categorized flow? 584 times over the 38-year period. 10,000 followed by 10,000, 773. Well, let's look to see what it's like under the releases from the dam just upstream. 4,000 followed by 4,000, three times. They went from 584 to three. How about that 10,000? It went from 773 up to 2008. So you can see the new regulation of the dam is clustering flows right into that mid flow at the expense of what would normally be going on here at the low flows. And those are fluctuating because of the cycling for power production on here. As far as the flow duration charts, we see this nice kind of a bimodal distribution. And here we can see things are squeezed in. Let's take a, a closer look. This, this is a breakout of the uh, flow class uh, limits on here. What's nice about graph is you can customize this. It can give you uh, a breakout so you have an equal number. 
between your different classes, or you can make it uh, an equal interval between your classes. What I've picked is neither of those. I have my own customized approach here. But let's, let's kind of zoom in here at this uh, bottom part. Notice I've changed my Y scale. Before I was going 5, 10, 15. Now I'm going 7, 14, 20, 28. So this is one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, two months, three months. And this is crazy. At the same time, you're getting these uh, sequences that are over three months long. You're getting hundreds of these two-day sequences. This is extremely flashy conditions. This is extremely persistent conditions, all uh, based on releases. But if we zoom in here, we can break this out. And again, Graffer makes it nice where I can put the value next to the data point. And here we have before uh, the dam, and we can see kind of the, the reduction of particular flow uh, sequences, depending on the category. We look here, and we can see how they are clustered. Most of the time, you might do a vertical analysis. But you know what you can also do? You can also do a horizontal analysis. The number of one-day sequences within the flow categories we're looking at here was 653 across all of these. One-day sequences here, 2,590. Just this one flow class by itself has as many flow classes for one day, uh, one-day sequences across all of these different classes here. So you can look across for horizontal analysis, or you can do a vertical analysis from a particular flow category of interest. So how do I do this? What's the, what's the secret sauce? What's the magic here? Uh, this is all done with Excel. No special program needed for calculating this. All the information is embedded in the data. What I have here is for input, I put in my, my flows. I put in the class interval based on the logarithm, 0.1, and the system will automatically change, cal calculate about uh, 23 categories. I always add one more beyond the maximum just to make sure I cover everything here. And there's the breakout of all the different categories. Now, this is just a guidance. You can change this to whatever study or whatever project you need. If I go ahead and I change my interval to 0.2, I have about half as many classes here. And the number of and levels of the category flows are updated as well. Once I put in these two values, or this value and, and the data, I will calculate out all these different columns. So I have a flat file. I've got my water year and my water day, day of the water year, day, the year of the water year. Here I've got a calendar day and a calendar year month, day, season, flow, lag flow. Those are the X and Y coordinates there. Or my estimated or my categorized flow, as well as duration for each of these flows here. I break out the different seasons. I use a lookup table here to use the month to determine the season. Here I have for my pairs, my X and Ys, if it's an increase, decrease, or no change and the maximum or the matrix count. Here's what I have for my duration. And then I have my pulse lines in here to do that. There's only about maybe 10 or 15 seed equations that are needed. Even though the spreadsheet itself might have 400,000 equations, computers are so quick anymore. It just updates so quickly. And um, when I get into my grapher, this is the part I really, really, really like about graph here is I have my x, y as coordinates of a map. And I have all my different data layers here. I can turn these on and off and update my flow chart uh, immediately. Here I just identify the Z for my winter, I mean summer, and my double A for my lag summer. And so I can go there and do that. And then I can also do the same thing for my flow duration chart. I, I can update this. Here's the options for the classes. You can do that and you, you can vary uh, any number of things here. So Drew, 
Well, I'll stop here briefly, but I want to get ready to show some actual uses of graphic and just to see if there's any questions that might have come up. Yeah, all right. I can't wait to see, uh, see this in action, Rick. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, again, if anybody has anything for Rick, please let us know. He'd be happy to address it. Uh, and in the meantime here, Rick, I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, back the floor here so we can see how this all works at Graffer. Okay, good. Can you see my Graffer screen? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it just fine. Thank you. Perfect. So here we go. Here we have the Colorado River. This is before the dam was in place. And so I'm looking at all flows. So I can turn that off. I can look at just, say, the summer flows. Or I can just look at the increases on here. But this is one of the cool things that I really like about this. Here I'm looking at all the different flows, all the flows. Under here, under plot, for those flows, we've got this data limits option. Click on the data limits, I can filter the data. So I click under here for filter, I can put in what my column is, my operator, and I can come up with something. I've got something I did the other day. And what I'm gonna do is look at the year to be equal to 1927, and I'm gonna look at the month equal to September. This is going back to that hurricane example I was showing you. And when I apply this, you can see that all that's left here, okay, are those data points associated with September. Now I can go in here to the all flow. I'm gonna add a line to connect these points. And here's my lag one hydrograph. If I zoom in here, I can see that there are one, two, three rises in September of 2000, uh, 1927, and I can see the uh, recession for these. And if I wanted to, I can come in here and for the labels, I can pick the date. I mean, but you know, I can just do the, I can just do the day number on here since I know which month it is because I already said September and there it is. I see the, the day number aligned with each of those data points. I just think that's the coolest thing. You can't do this in Excel or anything else like that. So I just, I just love this. And um, I have just a few more notes here. Let me uh, hop back to the talk. And let me do a little bit more on that. And so, um, you know, I get questions for people going, well, how can I use this? How can I use this? And it, it, anyone who needs to get more detailed information from um, a system, or you're doing a study, maybe a fishery study that you need to have. Uh, I have to look at the question here in just a second, Calvin. Um, how to break this out? Well, here's that, here's that flow chart before. And so rather than using this example plot where they're breaking out flows, how about we take our matrix here, and we overlay the flows on top of this. So look, we've got lines, points, areas, and this is like a temporal information system here. And I could overlay maybe the, the, the distribution of the flows themselves from each of the different seasons on here. Well, what this means is the versatility, we, we've got this new option, I developed it independently of any particular method. It's customizable. It can be used in conjunction with other methods. So here's three different methods. Hey, as long as it's based on a flow, I can overlay that on here for any of those different systems. So, okay, go ahead and do the tabular scorecard, but add this. This is a value added graphic which has all those benefits I had showed you earlier to go along with any other information that's being produced. One here summary, and then I'll answer Calvin's question. What have I given you that you didn't have an hour ago? You've got some new configuration metrics available to you, new data visualization options, this raster hydrograph, the change in flow plots, 
plots and matrix, seasonal plots, fluoration chart, line one, hydrograph. You now know that you can use time as an attribute. So now you can analyze all flows. This gives you incredible ability to customize what you have here versus one size fits all. Much more detailed information and data exploration. And there's my contact information. And let me look over here to Calvin. I think I was referring to what you call the raster hydrograph. You know, if you go back and look at some of the other wonderful webinars that Golden Software has, I have a couple that specifically talk about the development of a raster hydrograph and um, the steps to making one using Surfer. Yeah. I, so, yeah, there is a prior webinar on how to construct Rest or hydrograph. So yeah, there you go. Okay, Rick. Um, not to interrupt you there. I did just chat everybody. Um, three links on the chat to um, uh, your past presentations with us. So you can see those in the in the chat there. So if you want to access those, they're on our support website at support.goldensoftware.com. Yeah, and it's interesting if you were to Google USGS and rest or hydrograph, USGS has a way of producing those for any of the gauges in your system. They're not as versatile as what you can do on your own with Surfer, but it was based on my research that the USGS has is out there. But if you need to do a more detailed, uh, there's the one you can do for yourself. So there you go. Are, are there any other questions? Yeah, if anybody has any other questions, please send those on over. Uh, we'd more, be more than happy to uh, answer them. You're welcome, Calvin. Uh, Calvin, you're welcome. Well, just to let everyone know here, um, I am putting together a paper to publish in the American Water Resources Association's journal on this. It's a peer reviewed journal so that you can have access to that. I have used this material in an American Geophysical Union conference here earlier this year. If you're interested in that as a reference, please contact me and I'll be happy to pass that along. Um, thank you, Peter, for your, for your notes. Yeah, you'll have to think it over, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit different, but when you look at it, I think you can see it, it adds a lot to what's out there. Um, but I'm always open to talking, buddy, about any kind of collaboration. I'm, I'm certainly open for that. Right, well, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, say that this concludes our presentation today. Hopefully everyone found uh, the information that we covered today useful. If you have any additional questions on what was covered today or anything else grapher related, uh, now that we're concluding the, the presentation, you can either contact our technical support team at support at goldsoftware.com, or if you have anything specifically for Rick, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. Um, you can send him an email on his email address that we just had up there. Again, we're going to uh, post a recording by the end of the week. And on behalf of Golden Software, uh, we thank you very much. Again, Thanks, Rick. Thank, thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.